Welcome to Valley's Gold, a show where we explore the people and places who feed and clothe us. On this episode, we're learning about seeds. They're a key component of the growing process. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, on this adventure. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by The Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources, valley agriculture, and native wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our tables. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes. Brandt, professional agriculture. Alfalfa, an important crop for livestock feeds, uses a unique process in developing seed. To learn more what it takes, I'm meeting with Riley Cheney. Riley, thanks for joining me. Glad you guys could make it. Tell me about your farming operation. Well, we farm in Fresno County in the cities of San Joaquin and Tranquility. So as I said, I'm here to learn about alfalfa seed and talk about an unusual crop. It's just so different. I'm used to seeing regular alfalfa, but alfalfa seed's a whole different game. So let's begin with the basics. When do you put alfalfa seed in the ground? Well, once we know we want to plant it, we can do one of two things. Either plant it in the fall, for instance, October, November, or wait until January, February. Some guys wait until late as March in this area. Got it. Now, alfalfa for use for you know animals, is a perennial crop. It's a crop that you're going to keep in the ground typically three to six, seven years, just depending on how healthy it is. Now, what about this? Is this a terminal crop? Is this a one-time harvest? No, it's perennial also. We can, uh, depending on the processes we're working with, if they des desire the, to have the variety again, we can keep growing it for sometimes four, five, up to six years. Which is amazing because you walk through this field and you think this stuff's dead. I mean, it's dry out here, very dry. And I know that's done on purpose because we're going to talk about harvest here in a second. But you talked about putting the seed in the ground. What's it take to grow the alfalfa from that point? Well, we put the seed in the ground, water, of course, some cultivation to uh, not have weeds overtake the field as top for competition. Um, you raise it, get a full plant, just as alfalfa hay. But once it goes into a bloom, then we bring in bees to pollinate it and to set the seed. Got it. And when I, out here in the field, one thing that's different or, you know, from the other alfalfa is the fact that that's typically grown on flat land. You do have this in rows, and obviously that comes, obviously going to help you in harvest, but uh, is there any different cultural practices you have to use for this? Well, the reason we grow it in rows is mainly is for, for irrigation. Okay. We want the seed to be elevated, not to have direct contact with the water, Got uh, it. protecting it. Perfect. And one thing that's so unique about alfalfa seed is you talked about that pollination that takes place. Yes. Explain that process to me. That's the most critical part of growing alfalfa for seed, uh, is pollinating it. And nowadays we're trying to pollinate it in a short period of time. That might be from a period, a window of four to six weeks. We use honeybees and leaf cutter bees. So a leaf cutter bee. What is a leaf cutter bee? I'm familiar with honeybees, but a leaf cutter bee, I'm not really sure what that is. 
Well, the leaf cutter bee is, is like a honeybee that it's used to help pollinate crops. It, um, not just alfalfa seed, it's used in other crops. I know, for instance, blueberries use them sometimes. Honeybees, uh, we have always used those, and we've been using leaf cutter bees for quite some time now also. They work differently than a honeybee, but we find it very advantageous. And so we said leaf cutter bee, there must be some leaf cutting involved in this whole process? Yeah, they'll out there, they'll, they'll trip the flower or set the flower, but they'll also cut or bite the leaf, take that back to its nest, use it to, to re-nest, to reproduce um, for housing and so forth. Got it. Well, that's very, very cool. But I think what's even cooler is I'm out here during harvest of this alfalfa seed. It's early August. What's going on out here? Well, out here, uh, the alfalfa was green with just like the alfalfa hay, got into a big purple bloom. Bees came in, set it, um, and they set it. It matures over about a time to, to get the pod or the curl, which contains the seed. The fully matured takes maybe 30, 30 days, okay. plus or minus, probably a little longer. Uh, once it's ready and fully matured, uh, we, we dry down the plant, burn down, and the purpose of that is just to facilitate harvest. We get it to feed through the, the combine, and then so it can thresh out the seed out of the pods and just get the seed. And the dry down is just the absence of water, pulling water off, that's it? It's to desiccate the plant. Okay. To, to burn the plant back. Okay. But it will not, it, uh, not so much will it will kill it. It'll be able to come back another year with an irrigation. But it's just to facilitate and harvest. Got it. Okay. And then this beautiful piece of equipment's going through here and doing the harvest. What is it doing? It's taking in all the plant um, as much as it can just uh, as to... Be careful to get any pods or curls that contain the seed up off the ground. Um, it's a very slow process, a lot of times around one to one and a half miles an hour. Wow. Uh, because it's taking in so much uh, material, plant material, and but it has just a little fine seed, and it goes through a concave. Okay. And it threshes that pod where the seed falls out. Air will blow the, the chaff or the plant material, and the seed's heavier, and it'll stay in the combine. I know in agriculture, the quality of seed is incredibly important. Yeah. How do you make sure this is top quality stuff? What we do is we, we try to get it harvested without any, any weeds present in the field. As you know, most weeds, not all weeds have seeds. Yeah. We don't want there to be uh, weeds in the field that, that are the same size of seeds or any seeds that will get, then get in the mixing with our alfalfa seeds. Got it. Although, in it, Invariably, it does happen as, as dirt, but we'll send it to the processor, and then uh, they go through the cleaning process and get rid of all the anything that's noxious or right. anything that's not the true alfalfa seed. Okay. And once this leaves the field, once it's in the machine driving off, where does it go from there? It goes to the processor who we have contracts with, um, and then they are the ones that directly sell it throughout the world, domestically and internationally. Well, Riley, thank you so much. This has been an incredible incredible segment to come out here and see the basis of the agriculture industry. We can't do it without seeds and plants, and to get to come out here and see this happening in front of me was a cool experience. Always happy to show some people. We're all familiar with lettuce, thus it's only fitting we learn how lettuce seeds are produced. To educate us, I've been joined by Dan Avila of Central Valley Seeds, Inc. Dan, thanks for having me out here today. Oh, glad you're, to be here with you. I am in complete amazement of what's going on here, but let's begin with the basics. Tell me about this wonderful organization. Well, it started in 1987, really. We incorporated in April of 87, and all the four brothers joined us, and, uh, joined the company, and uh, we do have our varieties that we patent and develop our own. We have our own label that's represented in the Western United States and other, uh, other countries as well. So, um, so we just, uh, we just keep on going. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I, you talk about the four brothers. I mean, this is truly a family operation, four brothers, but you got a lot of also the kids now involved in the operation. Yes, we have a second generation of uh, a sons and a daughters uh, that are involved in the business and uh, they've picked up the trade real well and they know what they're doing. So it makes it easier for the owners. Yeah. Central Valley Seeds is known for their lettuce. And, but lettuces, I mean, there's a lot of different varieties. What kind of varieties are you producing here? We're well known for romaine lettuce. Um, I think we carry over 50% of the market, uh, marketplace and for growers. And that's what's so awesome is the story is that we think of the salad bowl being over in Salinas, but 
here you are right between Fresno and Sanger and you're doing some wonderful things with seed. <laughs> well, we're a hidden jewel out here. A lot of people <laughs> don't know what we do because uh, when, it, when lettuce is in the production stage, it doesn't look like romaine lettuce. It yeah. totally takes a different form and it has to be grown in the summertime. So we plant in April and start watering in May. And I don't think there's many crops that are susceptible to rain for the period that we experience with this seed during the harvest time. Explain that. Well, it, lettuce is a very minute seed and it's a very sensitive and uh, anything that hits it right at the end where we're harvesting uh, winds or whatever, um, rain, if we have uh, over an inch of rain, it'll uh, harm the, the, the seed itself and uh, it'll cause uh, germination loss. So it's very important that we get that harvest out of the way before the change of weather uh, happens. And that's usually after the 20th uh, to the 1st of September, things begin to change. So yeah. we, try to, we try to plant our planting schedules so we're, we're harvesting from uh, the uh, middle of July through the end of August and we're in a safe place doing that. And I think that's why the Central Valley is such a conducive place to grow in that seed is because we typically have there, that long growing season. There is, uh, this, this area here in Australia are the two only areas we can grow lettuce seed. Wow. Because of the daylight hours and the, and the time span that the lettuce will do well and produce well because of that. Got so um, there's no other place. And Dan, when it comes to growing this crop, uh, let's start with the basics. I mean, you, I see you have drip irrigation. That's a big part of this now. And so you'll make your beds. And what does it really take to grow a lettuce seed crop? We prepare the ground in January and we're, we're uh, out there plowing. We're doing everything to the ground to prepare it to be suitable for planting. So by the, by the uh, middle of April, we're ready to plant. And we'll, we'll plant in April and start watering in May. And the process starts. Uh, we, we bring it up, we thin it, uh, we weed it, we cultivate it all through these summer months. Yeah. And so it's just a tedious work, but it's a, it's a very important work to keep the fields very clean. And so at the end of the year, we have to be, have, a, have a guarantee that, that our, our lettuce seeds, every variety is going to be clean, uh, that there won't be any diseases in the, in the seed. And uh, believe me, there's uh, agencies, uh, California and all that, that test it to make sure we're selling that product as we say we are. Absolutely. Now, I know when it comes to harvest of this particular crop, there's a couple different ways it can be done, but nevertheless, harvest time is very important to this operation. Yes, it is. Um, we have a crew of people that come in. Uh, we have uh, contract labor people that bring in the labor force. There's two ways we do this. We machine harvest it with, the, with a combine um, because that minimizes the cost of the harvest, but uh, we usually actually have that machine in case there is a threat of rain that it can come in and wipe out our fields real quick and clean them up. And, but the uh, hand harvest is the number one item that we sell because it's not gone through machinery. And so when uh, the buyer wants it, they want to know, is this hand harvested or machine harvested? And the germination rate goes way up when we hand harvest stuff. But you're talking hand harvest. I mean, we're talking these seeds are very, very, I mean, you're talking almost the size of a period yes. on, a, on, a, on a piece of paper. So right, right. how do you hand harvest? We, we the train the people um, and uh, they're, they're actually going in the field with a, with a sickle and they cut the plant and throw it in the trailer. It goes into a trailer and they, they shake the plant in the trailer and it drops all the seed into the trailer. Okay. And so then from the field, you're going to haul it to the plant here in near Sanger. Yes. And what exactly does that process now consist of? There's some very neat machinery here, but yes. some very unique machinery. Yes. We'll take it into a 4x4 metal bin and it goes into the, in, from there into the bin and, and transport it over here to our warehouse. And so uh, it gets it to the place to where it's ready to go to our warehouse in Salinas to where it's going to the final product where it's going to get coated. The buyer buys it in, a, in our labeled box. Yes already coated and ready to go and ready to plant. Well, that's fantastic. Well, Dan, thank you so much. This has been so just neat to learn the basics of a product that most of us probably consume on a daily basis, exactly. but how it originates from right here in the valley. Yes, yes, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Um, and it's good to educate the people where it comes from. Absolutely. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sharing this information. You're welcome. Thanks. I'm at a farm in Sanger to learn how some farmers save their own seeds from year to year. 
I've been joined by Ia Yang to learn more. Ia, thanks for having me out to your farm today. Uh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ia, let's begin with, tell me a little bit about your operation here. Well, um, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they farm. And um, so they want us to get a piece of land that they can farm. And so we decided to get this property for them. And so... Um, and it's a beautiful property. You're yes. growing a lot of different crops out here. Yeah. Any many, idea how many? <laughs> Oh, I can't, I cannot count how many, but it's all different kinds of Asian specialties. Yeah, yeah. and you, you have everything from herbs out here to rice to lemongrass to you name it. There's a little bit to put on your plate every day, isn't yes. there? Yes, uh-huh, yeah. And one thing that's uh, unique about your story is that you're a first-generation California farmer. Yes. And so tell me about your story. How did you end up in California? A lot of people moved to Fresno to farm from yeah. every other state. And so when I got married, my husband was from here. Yeah. So he brought me over. You came over. And for several years, you worked at a job in the city. Yes. And today you're out farming full time. And it's a great operation. I'm so happy to be here today. And we're going to learn about how you're able to carry your seeds from year to year to year. Yes. And the two examples we're using, you do a lot of that with a lot of your different crops. But we have this mm -hmm. gorgeous rice field behind us. Yes. Tell me about this rice field and the varieties you have out here. Um, I have close to maybe 10 different kinds. 10 different kinds of yeah, rice, wow. Because each one tastes differently, each one produces differently and smells differently. So yeah. I do want to try it out and see which one's the best. And the rice that we see grown down here in the Central Valley on um, the, the Asian farms, it's a different kind of rice than what you're typically going to see in, say, Northern California. It's a much taller rice, and it, like you said, it's just a different tasting rice. Yes. Mm -hmm. And very labor intensive. You do a lot of this work all by hand. Yeah, all this is work by hand. Uh, use your hand to cut and, you know, uh, smash and all yeah. that stuff. And, yep. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to growing rice here in the Central Valley, when do you plant that rice and how hard is it to grow here? Uh, it's not that hard, but you have to make holes on the land, you know, Yeah. and drop the seed in there. And it takes uh, one full day to plant it, at least four four to five people. I got yeah. it, got it, got it. Here we are in late September, early October, where the mm -hmm. rice is pretty much ready to harvest at this time. In fact, mm -hmm. the one right behind us is, it's been chopped because you've harvested yeah. it already. Right. What are you looking for for the stuff you keep? Obviously, a lot of this is going to be eaten, but you're looking for certain types and kinds that grow well here, that yes. taste good, that you're going to save for the next year. Right, and you go and you pick the best uh, rice on the field, and you pick that one. Yeah. And you just dry it and save it for the next year. Because I know uniformity is very important to you. You're looking mm -hmm. for that best, so you get the yeah. best for the following year. Yes. And you just keep doing that year after year after year. Yes. Absolutely. And one thing that I found very unique is another one that you keep for seeds until mm -hmm. the following year mm -hmm. is what you would call is mong cucumber. Yes. And the mong cucumber, you have oh, an example yeah. for us. Right and here. This, you said this is a small one. They get yeah. very big, and you They're have some pictures big. of some yeah. very big ones. Mm -hmm. But this is a crop. Tell me the unique story, how you grow this. This is a little bit different. You grow this inside the rice. You only drop one seed. You, you mix it with, with your rice seed, and you just drop one or two inside there, and it just grow along the rice. Got it. And yeah. so you plant at the same time as you're planting the, the same rice? Same time. And then when the rice is about your knee high, it started, the, the cucumber started blooming. Got it. Yes. And so you, you have two crops in one area. Yes. And it amazes me that this crop actually grows because it's very dense in there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of cover from rice because you can't see the ground. It's so thick. Right. But this does very well, and yeah. you're able to harvest this for several months before the rice comes off. Right. And plus, um, you don't want to grow a lot of these in there because the vines start pulling your rice down. Yeah. Very so you grow one seed, and you grow, like, different spot. You don't yeah. grow all in one spot. But this yeah. is a tradition you told me that you brought over from the old country. That right. You did the same thing over there. Yes. It's still very important today. Mm -hmm. And when they're harvesting the rice, they get thirsty, they eat this. Got it. Oh, so it's a it's a secret ingredient yes. out of the field. Yes. Not it. <laughs> and um, tell me about this then. So how do you harvest the seeds from this cucumber? You take it out and you cut it open and you take out the seed and you dry it under the shade and oh. you save the seed for the next year. Okay. So, well, great, Ia. Thank you so much for sharing your story and allowing me to come out and visit your farm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm at a farm in Riverdale to learn about a popular crunchy treat that originates in the valley. To discuss this crop, I've been joined by Buddy Mendez. Buddy, thanks for having me out today. Hey, thanks for having me, Ryan, and thanks for coming down to the end of the road, right next to the Lamore Naval Air Station. We're Absolute. just off the runway here. <laughs> Absolutely. I keep hearing these jets circling around us, but uh, Buddy, I'm here to learn about a very special crop grown in here in the valley, but before I get there, tell me about your farm operation. Okay. Um, originally, I was in the dairy business with my dad and brother, and about 1990, we... Uh, um, I, I split off and started farming, and I started farming this ranch, and uh, I bought other ground. I farmed actually closer next to the runway over by the Lemoore Naval Air Station, and uh, we farm a little bit in Stratford, and we have uh, Pima cotton, regular cotton, wheat. Got it. And okay. we also have corn nuts. Corn nuts, and yeah. that is one unusual crop. It's Corn nuts is a crop that it's a brand name that I don't think a lot of folks would ever associate with the valley, but pretty much all the corn nuts that you ever see are grown here in the valley. Yeah, they're grown right here in the valley, Ryan. In fact, there's no nuts in corn nuts. It's <laughs> exactly. all corn. So is there anything different about this corn? Is it grown differently? Is it a different variety? What makes it different and makes it a corn nut? Okay, the variety actually, you know, uh, you know, before we started talking, we sampled some raw corn and you can actually taste the corn nut taste in it. So, and that's one thing I was impressed with. I mean, I really did notice that difference. I mean, it just the, the texture is a little bit different, obviously, in the state when it's coming from the field, but that taste, that, that aftertaste is really there. Yes, you can pick up that aftertaste. It's, it's right there. But this corn is, um, of course, the production is a lot less than regular field corn. It's very, this variety is very susceptible to plant population. So you have to be pretty close on, you know, on your plant population when you plant it. But um, other than the amount, I mean, you get about half the amount of corn that you would on wow. a very good, you know, field corn, you know, production. Of course, the ears are a little smaller. Yeah. But the corn itself is, is a bigger corn. But it's, it's bred specifically for corn nuts. Right. It's bred for uh, food, you know, for human consumption. So corn nuts is grown pretty similar to our field corn that we do for silage and other purposes here. You talked about a lot less density. Is there any difference as far as the season or how long it takes to harvest this crop? Okay, it's a full season corn, which means it's 120 day corn. Okay. But here's the, some of the key components. It needs to be harvested a little bit wet. Normally corn, you want it to be, you know, below 14% you know, or lower, where this corn here, you want to harvest it probably between 16 and, and 20%. Okay. Because it's very critical that you don't crack it. So and when my, you say crack it, the actual kernel. Right. You don't want to so, see. so uh, we actually have our own harvesters. That's how we got into it because we were harvesting corn for people that we know. And um, you have to set the machine different than you would with field corn. And because the, the whole deal is, you do not want to crack the corn. Got it. Okay. Because it becomes basically worthless if it's cracked. And then it from once we harvest it, it goes to a uh, food consumption dryer. And I think there's only one left in the valley, so they can only do about 10 loads a day. Got it. Okay. So, so it has to be dried. It has to be dried. Right, and stabilized, and then from there it goes to the plant into storage. Because once it's dried, then you can store it. And for the person at home, when you say 16 to 20 percent moisture, they're thinking, okay, I mean, you're saying it's wet, and so there's probably some texture to it. This kernel is still pretty dry. Even oh, yes. That, it's a yes. very, very hard kernel. Here's the problem. In, in grains, if you don't dry them, they will mold. Yes. You cannot put them into storage. Absolutely. They will mold if there's too much moisture in there. So how do you harvest corn nuts? Okay, you, you bring in a conventional harvester. This is, harvester is a six row, 38 inch. Right. And uh, the corn goes through the harvester and it, uh, the, the cobs come off. They go into the bullet rotor and the bullet rotor knocks knocks the grain off and it falls off and goes into the hopper and everything, all the rest of the, the crop goes out the back. Well, that's incredible. And you talked about the sensitivity towards making sure those densities are right. Is there big pest pressures when it comes to? It's, it's pretty standard. One of the things you have to do is you have to make sure you don't have any ear worm damage. Okay. You know, if people that, you know, usually 
the average person buys store bought and corn, you know, yep. even eating corn, so they don't, you know. Yep. But you know, you grew up on a farm just like I did, so if you grew some field corn, you would have a few worms on the end of yep, it. So. Exactly. But this yeah. is very critical that you don't have that. Yeah. Because, because any do. worm damage, that's just damaged damage. corn. Yeah. yeah. And buddy, you actually have some samples that you're going to show me from the field to what the finished product looks like. What do we have here? Yeah. Well, we've got. Uh, you know, raw corn nuts over here, and then we have the finished product right here. And you can see that there is some similarities to A lot it. of similarities, especially to the, you look at the kernel there, you see a lot of the same shape and the same center type of color and everything else. Just big a difference is, is the finished ones, you actually have a little bit of a puffiness to them. Right, you have cooked, uncooked. uncooked. <laughs> well, great, buddy. This has uh, been an incredible experience to learn about. I think it's a crop that uh, obviously everybody sees on the snack aisle. A lot of us have had it since a kid and love this product, but to know that it's grown in the valley is I think one of those things that nobody knew about and something to be extra proud of. Yeah, that, I mean, it's very interesting that, you know, all the corn nuts that are ate are actually grown here. Right here in the valley. Right here in the valley. Well, awesome, buddy. I appreciate so much you inviting me out to your farm to see this really unique crop. Thank you, Ryan. I've had some real fun sharing what I've learned about California seeds, even if it was a little corny. I hope you'll join me next time for more Valley's Gold. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by the Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources Valley Agriculture, and Native Wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our tables. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes, Brandt. Professional agriculture.